It's been another crazy week at Starbase. We finally learned where the second launch tower is going to go. Mmm, roughly. We also saw SpaceX abort wet dress rehearsal testing with Ship 28 and Booster 10 before rolling Booster 10 back to the production site and Ship 28 over to suborbital pad B. And finally, as is tradition, we have new road closures posted. So it's a lot to talk about. Let's get started. I'm Jack Beyer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. Sponsored by Opera. Let's begin our journey with the infrastructure work that happened this week. Most of this work, but not all of it, took place at the production site, though important work also took place at the launch site. For example, the work on the tank farm is not yet done. This week we saw the delivery of several tanks and vaporizers to the launch site. These are needed for fueling and detanking of ship and booster prototypes at the launch pad. They might also be related to a possible further expansion of the tank farm to support a second launch pad, which we'll discuss more in a bit. Over at the chopsticks, SpaceX performed some modifications to the stabilizers that are used to give vehicles additional stability and position them on more than one axis during a lift. Another novelty we might see during the next lift is the fact that one of the ship lifting pins was moved closer to the tower. This probably helps alleviate stress on the chopsticks as the ship is now closer to the tower. A verification of the modification was performed later. Try saying that three times fast. Regarding the vaporizers, we saw them being delivered to the orbital tank farm at the launch site. This might be a necessary upgrade for the next full wet dress rehearsal attempt, as SpaceX may have learned during the last two aborted wet dress rehearsals, though this is of course just speculation. This could have already been planned prior to whatever caused the aborted WDRs. Moving back to the production site, over at the Mega Bay, we saw stacking of Booster 14's liquid oxygen tank. If no boosters are skipped or reused, Booster 14 would be used for the seventh flight of Starship. Outside of the Mega Bay, we can also see a Booster 14 aft barrel section, which will join the LOX and methane section at some point. Next to the Mega Bay, over in the High Bay, are ships 30 and 31, which are having final work done on their thermal protection systems. SpaceX is really lining up the vehicles behind the third flight stack, which shows why they want to get more testing and launching capabilities on tap in Boca, and why they've requested to launch nine times this year. Nine times. Next up, a quick check-in over at the Rocket Garden, where there hasn't been much movement in the last week. We still have the retired Booster 4 and Ship 20 here, but also Ship 32, which features an almost complete thermal protection system, and Ship 26, which features many, many new stringers and remains a mystery. It also remains cursed. Boo, Ship 26, boo. Before we continue, let's go to Sawyer to hear a quick word from this video's sponsor. People always ask me, how can you come up with puns so fast? How are you so quick-witted? Can you please stop for five seconds? To answer the last part, no. But the first two, it helps when you're using a super fast browser like Opera. Opera is literally the browser I use every day. Link to my computer, and even my phone. One of my favorite features are tab islands. Basically, decluttering your browser bar and keeping everything that's related in one place. You should see how many tabs I have opened during a launch, and yet they're all neatly organized. I also have super quick access to all my social media platforms just on the sidebar so that I can share things really quickly. Also on the sidebar, Aria, Opera's AI assistant. Need a space fact and quick? Aria's got you. The browser isn't just meant for speed, but safety, coming with its own VPN and an ad blocker for those less than reputable sites. I highly recommend you give Opera a try as your browser, and you can try it by clicking my link in the description below. Why did the sun go to school? To get brighter! <laughs> okay, Aria wrote that one. See? It really gets me. Now, let's get you back to the video. Over at the Star Factory, we saw further progress on the roof of the new part of the structure. Most of the roof is now fully cladded, and the walls are also progressing. This section is a bit taller than the rest of the Star Factory, and will likely be utilized for taller structures such as nose cones. Inside the Star Factory, we can see workers spraying paint onto the roof. This might not only be for cosmetic reasons, but also protective. While we're doing our weekly check-ins before moving on to the big topics, let's also check in with the HLS mock-up nose cone. 
This shot really shows you the size of the mock-up compared to the Tiki Bar here. It seems like active work on it has mostly stopped, though we are of course still patiently waiting and watching for any evidence of Artemis and HLS work in Starbase. Next up, SpaceX is also continuing work on their new office building. As a reminder, this building will go up next to the Star Factory, and it'll be a five-story building that provides office space for Starbase. And it also further underlines SpaceX's commitment to the area. That's it for infrastructure this week, but we have an amazing tidbit of information regarding the second tower in Starbase, so let's focus on that next. It has been an active week in regards to the second launch tower. Not only did we see the arrival of more hardware, we also got a good clue as to where it might go. Active Starbase update watchers already know this, but here we go. Four tower segments for the second launch tower arrived via barge from the Cape. These tower sections were already constructed there and were shipped to Boca Chica over the last week or two. The tower sections entered the port of Brownsville and are being stored there until they're needed for construction, or at least until they're moved to the Sanchez lot for staging ahead of being stacked. Since the only road into Boca Chica is Highway 4, it will require a multi-hour road closure to transport the segments all the way down from the port to Starbase. Here is Tower Section 8, already stored at the production site. It is one of the last sections at the very upper end of the tower. With all this hardware on the move, it's feeling more and more likely that we'll see the second launch tower sooner rather than later in Starbase, but don't hold your breath. Even at SpaceX's breakneck pace, it's likely that it'll be one to two years until we see a second pad activated and used. Though, of course, I'd love to be wrong about that. Okay, so that's the state of affairs, but let's talk about the million dollar question here. Where is the second orbital launch pad and tower going to go? Well, this week, the Army Corps of Engineers has informed the public that SpaceX has restarted the permitting process for the second tower. Hooray! In a document published on February 22nd, the Army Corps said that SpaceX reinitiated the permit application on 12 February 2024 with modified project plans and a request to fill in a 0.16 acre wetland to construct a second orbital launch pad, which will replace the current suborbital launch pad and test stand. You can see on the map here that 0.16 acre wetland area is this little notch right there. And that makes sense if they're going to put this on the suborbital launch pad. I guess we can't really call it the suborbital side anymore, but you get what I mean. This all fits well with the fact that we have seen SpaceX starting to remove the recently finished parking lot at the suborbital side of the launch site. This clearly seems to be related to the fact that this area will be needed for the second launch pad. Now, two questions remain. The first is where exactly on the suborbital side the tower and pad will go, and the second is if both orbital pads will share one tank farm or if SpaceX will construct a second one. The recent expansion at the tank farm we talked about at the start of the episode might indicate that one tank farm will be used for both pads, but only time will tell if this speculation is accurate. All right, now let's talk Ship 28 and Booster 10. At the beginning of the week, the dance floor was raised below Booster 10. This platform is used to access the aft end of the booster and provides a workspace below the booster to ease inspection of Raptors, the launch mount, and much more. Usually, before lifts, this platform is lowered. And so when this happened, we got our first sign that the full stack was not going to last. Then, signs of a ship D-stack joined the mix. The ship QD, used to fuel the ship, was disconnected from S28. With this, the ship was ready to be lifted away from Booster 10. Additionally, some of the lines that are usually used during testing were disconnected shortly after by workers using the extended work platform on the ship QD. These cables are not attached during launch and their exact purpose during testing is unclear. After all of this work was performed, the ship QD work platform was then retracted again to give the ship room for the lift. And finally, the ship QD arm was then swung away to allow for the ship's removal. At this point, it was pretty clear that a D-stack was coming. Lo and behold, just 20 minutes later, the full stack was no more. After a few days on top of Booster 10 and two aborted wet dress rehearsal attempts, Ship 28 was removed from Booster 10. At this point, we don't know what exactly happened during the two aborted wet dress rehearsals, and SpaceX has not released a statement as to why the vehicle was destacked. As a bonus though, during the destacking, we got this great shot from Mary where we can see all six engines below Ship 28. What's noticeable is the difference in one of the RVAC engines. This could be a potentially replaced engine, as it still seems relatively clean. But, as always, take that with a grain of salt, and we could be completely wrong here. 
Side note, if you want this image in your living room or office or bedroom or wherever, you can get it in our metal print store at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. And a portion of the sale goes to the photographer who took this image, which is of course, Mary. Also noteworthy here is Ship 28's heat shield. With each and every vehicle, we see an increase in the quality of the thermal protection system, with less gaps and more rigor and quality control applied to the TPS. 28 was then placed on its transport stand to be moved away from the tower and orbital launch mount, but where would it go? At this point, there were multiple options, although some more likely than others. Of course, the vehicle could stay at a safe place to be stored until the next wet dress rehearsal attempt or it could have been rolled back to the production site to have further work done on it. And the third option was a roll over to suborbital pad B, where the potential new Raptor we mentioned earlier could be tested. After the lift, the ship QD arm then moved back into its closed position, and the aft flaps of ship 28 were secured for transport. Shortly after, the forward flaps were closed as well. A big hint as to where Ship 28 was headed was the two-point lifter, which had just been moved over to suborbital pad B. This chopstick-like lifting system is used to lift modern ships to the suborbital stand in place of the old lifting points on the nose cone and load spreader we affectionately nicknamed the lifting squid. With this new system, the crane attachment points on the nose cone can be deleted earlier in production, and thus the TPS can be completed earlier as well. You can see the attachment points for the two-point lifter right below the flaps. You can also observe that the forward flaps were not just retracted, but also secured with lines. Of course, lifting such a heavy vehicle is quite precarious, so the steps to prepare it are done with caution. Two workers on each lift are attaching the two-point lift brackets to the lifting points carefully without damaging the TPS. Like a pair of tongs, the system then grabs the ship and closes in on the lifting points. And just like that, Ship 28 was lifted and placed onto suborbital pad B, and shortly afterward, it was connected to the suborbital fueling system. So that solves the mystery of Ship 28's destination, but its purpose remains unclear. At this point, we don't know for sure if this is just for temporary storage or some kind of proof or maybe even engine testing. That said, given the current road closures, which we'll get to here in a minute, some sort of engine testing, be it a spin prime, a pre-burner, or static fire testing, seems likely. The two-point lifter remained attached to the ship for a time, and this makes sense because later the access hatch on its methane tank was opened. It seems like SpaceX had some work to do inside of the ship before they could commence with any potential testing campaign. Here you can see the open hatch on Ship 28, and the crane and lifter attached to give the vehicle additional stability while unpressurized. A few days later, we then saw both the methane and payload hatch open as workers inside of Ship 28 performed unknown work inside the vehicle. In preparation for what might be a bit of a longer stay on suborbital pad B, the ship transport stand was then removed from the area. In fact, it was later moved away from the launch site and back to the production site. But then, a different ship stand took the place of the previous one and was moved to the launch site. Potentially some work or modifications are needed on the previous stand, especially after the post-stacking shenanigans we saw happen. Loud, ominous thump, anyone? A bit later, the SPMT also left the area. The two-point lifter has since been removed and laid on the ground as of early Saturday. At the same time as Ship 28 was being lifted onto Pad B, the chopsticks were closing around Booster 10. It became clear that SpaceX had decided to remove not just Ship, but both vehicles from the OLM. Before the lift of Booster 10, crews were working on the Booster Quick Disconnect system, which is the equivalent of the ship QD, but on the booster side. This system needs to disconnect, ideally quickly, it's literally in the name, before a booster can be lifted off the pad. Sure enough, the BQD was disconnected and its protective hood was closed, but the booster was not lifted. This back and forth continued as the BQD opened again at night. It seems like SpaceX was either testing something before the removal or was running into issues with the BQD during lift operations. After the hood closed once again, it was finally time to lift Booster 10. And in the middle of the night, B10 was removed from the orbital launch mount for yet unknown reasons. The lift actually started relatively fast. Look at the real time speed of the start of the lift. As a reminder, each ring on the booster is roughly two meters or six feet high. The Raptor engines were exposed just seconds into the lift, and alas, they're still in their booties. No serial numbers for us. After the speedy lift, the booster was placed on its transport stand. 
Of course, the last few meters went a bit slower, as SpaceX does not want to dent Raptors or drop a booster. Concluding the lift, the chopsticks were removed from the booster and the dance floor raised to provide a work platform inside the OLM. But it's not all bad news regarding the Flight 3 vehicles. Here's some good news. The arrival of the flight termination system for the third flight was observed this week. That's right, there was a delivery of explosives shortly after D-Stack, during the day. The charges were moved to the FTS bunker, where they are usually stored until needed for the installation on ship and booster. But the action for the week did not stop here. The Mega Bay door was opened, which gave us a pretty good clue of what was about to happen to Booster 10. B10 then entered Highway 4 and drove past our cameras, giving us some nice close-up shots during daylight before entering the production site. So many of these moves these days take place at night, so you gotta love a good daytime roll. It's hard to say what the main reason for the wet dress rehearsal delay is. We now have Ship 28 in testing again on Pat B, we have Booster 10 in the Mega Bay for further work, and we have work on the OLM, which, of course, continues. And indeed, the issue might be any one of, or even all three of these components of the launch system. Stage 0, Stage 1, or Stage 2. In the Mega Bay, Booster 10 was attached to cranes and lifted onto the work stand, confirming this move was not just for storage, but to perform additional work on the vehicle. It seems like the dance floor will also stay at the orbital launch mount for a bit of time, as its stand was moved away from the launch mount. After a few days of work, Ship 28's methane tank was completely closed again, but you can still see the payload section open. You can also see all the remove before flight tags that are attached to the payload door. According to a statement from Elon Musk a few months ago, during the third flight, they want to test this door, so that's something to look forward to. Next up, the two-point lifter stand was also moved away from the launch site and back to the production site on Wednesday. This makes sense, since the two-point lifter won't be needed in this area until the removal of Ship 28 from Pad B. So where are we with testing? Well, currently there's road closures scheduled for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week. With the fact that the booster is at the production site, it's likely that these closures are for Ship 28. The question is just, how deep will this testing go? And will they perform just proof testing, or a spin prime, or maybe even a static fire, to validate the suspected engine work on this prototype. So SpaceX has seemingly encountered some issues on their path towards Flight 3. We'll see how the next week goes, and maybe we'll learn when Booster 10 will return to the launch pad and get reunited with Ship 28. It remains to be seen how far away we are from Flight 3, but I think at this point it's safe to say it's not going to happen before the end of March. Alright, that's it for this week. Thanks to Opera for sponsoring this video, and thank you to you for watching. And as always, don't forget, be Excellent to each other.